Good morning. Welcome to uh, our Nebraska Department of Education World Language and CLTA US Six Small Interest Group K-12 uh, Fall Guest Speaker Series. I'm Chris Liu. I'm their World Language Specialist at Nebraska Department of Education. I would like to introduce our mission again. Our mission is to empower educators to engage students in the authentic use of word language via standard-based instruction to fulfill a range of functions, from expressing personal needs to communicating in the workplace and to establishing strategic relationships across cultures so that they may learn, earn, and live. And our co-sponsor, Chinese Language Teachers Association Small Interest Group K to 12. Um, they have their mission as well. Uh, Guan Laoshi, could you please introduce their mission? Okay, uh, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, I'm Chimei Guan, I'm the current leader for the special entry group of K-12 classroom and the methodology uh, for CLTA, the National Chinese uh, Teacher Association. And then we create a professional platform with the uh, Nebraska uh, Department of Education and to connect K-12 Chinese teachers, yes, and uh, try to uh, connect more uh, foreign language teachers uh, to learn about the methodology and the pedagogy. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We work together and, and we will continue to work together next year and to bring more guest speakers. And today um, we invited uh, Dr. Alga Tur I'm sorry, can you help me pronounce your last name again? <laughs> Petranko. Petranko. Thank you. And she's going to present interactive online instructions in a flipped Russian classroom. And I'm super excited because I've never tried to start to do to have a flip Russian uh, flip classroom myself. I really want to do, but I have never had a chance to do it. So I'm ready to learn. Also, I would like to um, introduce something. I mean, talk about a little bit about what's happening, what's going to happen in 2023. We're going to have Dr. Muller and she is my um, academic supervisor uh, when I was in my uh, doctor program, and she's going to she is going to be one of our guest speakers in the spring, uh, two thousand twenty three. And also Cho, the founder of CEO about literacy, and he is going to speak for us as well. And also, uh, Doctor Sergio Press. He's coming back. So, and I would like to um, talk about this again. If you are interested in presenting in our guest speaker series, please scan the QR code or just email me and we can talk and we can get started. And also this QR code and this link is for the webpage that uh, for all the recordings the recording of each webinar will be posted within a week. So today's web webinar will be posted by, I think, Friday, next week. And here we are, Dr. Olga Tolarenko. Did I say it right? Yes. <laughs> uh, could you please introduce yourself? Absolutely. So my name is Olga Tatarenko, and I am originally from Ukraine, but I am Associate Professor of Practice of Russian at uh, University of Nebraska-Lincoln at the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures. And uh, our Russian program has a major at UNL, and this is the only Russian program and the only major Russian major in Nebraska. So a very proud to have a strong program and we always look into recruiting more students into a program and, and making connections with high schools and making our courses available through Nebraska now. That's something I'm going to mention toward the end of the presentation. 
Uh, well, uh, I, my expertise, as you can see, I have um, uh, training in language pedagogy, and uh, um, now I, uh, my interest is in experiential learning, and I try to introduce project-based assignments, experiential learning opportunities for my students in my classes. Uh, and my current uh, interest is in utilizing VR, virtual reality instructions in my Russian language classes. But today I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about flip classroom and um, uh, interactive activities and platforms that I use in my classes uh, throughout the program, throughout the Russian curriculum at UNL uh, to make students learning uh, interactive, engaging, to increase, to enhance motivation of students uh, in, in the Russian language. So I apologize uh, for my voice. I'm getting over the cold, so my voice can fail me from time to time. So I might mute myself from time to time to take, take a cough. Uh, on that note, I think uh, I'm done with the introduction and I'm ready to start. Go ahead, please. How does that sound? Okay. And uh, let me find my presentation. Okay. <clears throat> Can you see my screen? Okay. So uh, in this presentation, this presentation is uh, organized, is structurally divided into two parts. And at the beginning, I want to talk more about a flipped classroom as a concept, uh, how I approach uh, flipping the classroom uh, personally in my Russian curricula at UNL, uh, what strategies I used, what um, pedagogical guidance I followed, what tips what considerations were at the center uh, if an educator thinks about flipping a classroom and it doesn't have to be a language classroom uh, but basically this is pertinent to uh, teaching language and in the second part of the presentation I'm going to show you some examples of how a flip classroom looks for my students on canvas we're using canvas as uh, the platform for our students I want to show you some uh, examples of activities and uh, uh, my favorite platform uh, a tool to create uh, language and uh, learning games that can be embedded in the classroom uh, uh, on canvas so I'm going to show you some content types and walk you through that and if we have time I'd be happy to answer any question and maybe we'll have time to create something together in the end I'd be happy uh, to be here and guide you and help you if you want to try to to create something uh, of your own and uh, so let me start. <laughs> So basically, when we think about a language classroom, a language curriculum, uh, I always uh, take uh, uh, keep in mind uh, the following uh, keywords, key terms. This is language proficiency. That is, what is language proficiency at every level that uh, we are teaching at the beginner's level, intermediate level, and advanced. Uh, we always think about can-do statements, reverse or backward design, test-based -based, uh, language teaching, and test-based language assessment. And I'm going in my the first uh, part of my presentation, I'm going to touch and discuss those things uh, in more details. So what is language proficiency and uh, why it's important? So basically, uh, we always take into uh, consideration uh, the uh, actful um, pyramid, language proficiency a pyramid, when we design the curriculum, when I am also a coordinator uh, in the Russian program. And that's something that my first talk with all my lecturers and instructors start with going through over the language pyramid, a profic language proficiency pyramid and what it means. Language proficiency refers to a person's ability to use the language for a variety of purposes, including for basic skills, speaking, listening, reading, and writing. 
And proficiency is commonly measured using guidelines developed by the American Council of the Teaching of Foreign Language. And this is an amazing resource for any uh, educator, for any uh, language teacher. So how do we uh, measure language proficiency? Uh, I didn't realize I had this, so let me, uh, let me do this. So basically in, uh, in this, uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus on the um, beginner's level and intermediate level uh, because that's where I flipped my classroom. Uh, I'm doing it in the advanced level as well, but it's very efficient in, in the, at the beginning and intermediate level. So when we look at the uh, proficiency pyramid, and, and you can see it starts from a very small point and it goes wider toward, toward the top. And so at the novice level, uh, it's in the blue zone. Students can communicate with formulaic and wrote utterances, lists, and phrases. So basically during the introduction of the language in the first year, the students are also referred to as parrots because they, they mimic, they memorize, and they play back, they repeat. Uh, and that's their interaction. We cannot expect meaningful interaction in the target language at the, inter at the novice level. And that's why this level is the smallest. You can't really be stuck in this level for a long time. One year is perfect to move on. Then uh, we go to intermediate level. This is basically the second year of language study. And at this level, there is the transition for students and students try to create now with the language using a string of sentences. They try to speak in sentences in the foreign language. And this is also a challenging transition from the novice level to intermediate because they have to start asking for uh, asking and answering a simple question and engaging in uh, a simple uh, situation, simple community communicative exchanges. And uh, so the idea, again, at the novice level, it's a, a separate phrases, memorized words, memorized phrases uh, in familiar situation. At the intermediate level, students have to come up with strings of sentences. And when we move to the advanced level, at the advanced level, students already have to start speaking in a paragraph long narration, which is very challenging from strings of sentences to a paragraph long long narration on the topics that don't just concern you personally, me personally as intermediate, me in the middle. Now at the advanced level, they have to talk about issues of society in paragraph long narration. So this is a very difficult transition and you can be, you can stay in the intermediate uh, level for a couple of years, or you can you can stay there for a longer time. And in the advanced level, you can definitely spend many years at the advanced level and never reach a superior level because superior has different proficiency uh, outcomes. But at the university, we try, uh, so the, the basic language program uh, is structured so students start with the novice and they, uh, the, ideally they should reach advanced low, advanced mid, within four years. Uh, and of course, that would be ideal if students could go um, uh, you know, abroad to, uh, to study in the country of the target language for some period of time to cement uh, the proficiency level. Uh, so, um, so, okay. And every level also has sub-levels. Sub and uh, so basically, when we design the curriculum at every, um, uh, at every level, the first thing I discuss with my lecturers and uh, instructors with my faculty 
uh, what are the expectations for every level? And it's very important that the lecturer, the, the instructor understands those expectations and proficiency goals because the, how the uh, curriculum is designed depends strongly on, the, it has to be aligned, the curriculum activities, exercises, everything should be aligned with the uh, proficiency uh, proficiency expectations at every level. And so again, when we talk about novice high, and this is our goal for first year students uh, to, uh, so by the end of the first year of language instructions, uh, and we look at interpersonal communication and presentational speaking, presentation meaning prepared speech. So it, we, it, we talk about interpersonal communication, a student at this level, and and this is I can statement. Uh, the students should be able to communicate and exchange information about familiar topics using phrases and simple sentences, sometimes supported by memorized language. And they usually can handle short social interactions in everyday situations by asking and answering simple questions. And at the presentational speaking, students have to be able to present basic information on familiar topics using language, uh, I ha they have practice using phrases and simple sentences. So this is the first year of language instruction. When we move to the second year of language instruction, we expect that by the end of the second year, students won't be an intermediate high, but we want them to be at intermediate mid. And uh, for that purpose, we the tasks, uh, the the um, the activities, the assessments uh, should be focus on uh, introducing and helping students with tasks that uh, that are at intermediate mid. So at intermediate mid, uh, students should be able to participate in conversation on familiar topics using sentences in series of sentences. They should be able to handle short social interactions in everyday situations by asking and answering in a variety of questions. And they should be able to say what what they want to say about themselves and their everyday experience, as well as uh, their families, friends, and their uh, personal experience. Um, and presentational speaking, they should make presentations on a variety of familiar topics using connected sentences. So we're talking about the ability of uh, creating with the language at the intermediate level. At the novice level, students can't create with the language which they can put something together that what they know at the second level since they already know some instructions uh, some uh, grammar foundation um, you know, gr grammatical uh, foundation they should start creating with the language and they start with separate sentences and strings of sentences so this is very important uh, for every uh, instructor, language instructor to understand because uh, instructors tend if they're not familiar with those terms and proficiency levels, they might have higher expectations of students. They might want more uh, from students at the intermediate level where they have to be everything, their work should be guided by understanding the proficiency objectives, the learning outcomes and learning objectives. Uh, so this is um, intermediate and, and novice. And when we move into the last, um, uh, in the 300 level instructions, and again, the pyramid goes wide toward the top, and we can spend a lot, many, many years in the advanced level. But when there is this transition from intermediate to advanced, now uh, all classes at 300 level should have the tasks for students that are at the advanced low level uh, if we want students to reach intermediate high, if that makes sense. So we want, if our purpose uh, um, is to prepare students and to cement uh, intermediate high level of proficiency, students have to start engaging uh, with the advanced low tasks 
and usually the high, the intermediate high, advanced low, they intersect in their tasks. But uh, the uh, the idea is that we practice tasks at advanced low, but we understand that students will be failing at some tasks because, but they will be solo defying uh, their proficiency at intermediate high. So this is basically how we look at curriculum in general with the understanding of proficiency outcomes at every level. And these, this understanding, this knowledge should inform the uh, instructor uh, about the way how to best approach uh, the material, the, the learning uh, materials, how to select the tools, and how to organize uh, the, the classroom, the language classroom. So uh, when I work as a coordinator, when I work with my uh, my faculty, my uh, my lecturers, uh, I always uh, uh, use, we always use six guiding principles uh, when we talk about curricula, uh, curricular uh, alignment. And first, this is reverse design. Second, maximizing in and out of class time. Third, focus on functional language use. Fourth, formative assessment, formal or informal, uh, then purposeful use of materials, and the last one, intentional and strategic use of technology. So those six guiding principles are key for any uh, curriculum development, uh, and I'm going to stop um, and discuss briefly every principle uh, because the knowledge of that is kind of important uh, if, if someone wants to build the curriculum or um, flip the classroom. So the reverse design. Uh, so with the reverse design, uh, we have, oops, yes. Uh, so we, again, uh, uh, reverse design, uh, when we develop the curriculum, we have to uh, keep in mind our language pyramid and the learning outcomes for every level. And uh, the first thing to do is not write a syllabus for the course, but identify and define desired results. That means that what do I want my students to be able to do by the end of first year, by the end of the second year, by the end of the third year, uh, should be in line with the language proficiency at that level. Then we have to think, okay, how am I going to measure that? And then we have to think about proficiency uh, assessment. And then we think about curriculum and how to design, develop a curriculum uh, and plan learning experience and instruction. And uh, in order to design a proficiency-oriented and performance-based curriculum. And the questions we have to keep in mind, first, what key knowledge and skills will students need in order to perform effectively and achieve desired target outcomes? Then what activities will equip students with the needed knowledge and skills? Then what will need to be taught and coached and how it should be best taught? And what materials and resources are best to accomplish these goals. This is the principle of reverse de design. So we are not guided by textbooks. We are guided by those questions. Those questions inform us how to uh, collect uh, uh, the materials, what materials to use, what platforms to use. Uh, so uh, we meet our learning goals. <clears throat> Um, so uh, the second principle, focus on functional language use. Uh, whether we practice grammar or vocabulary, uh, vocabulary re working on our language skills with reading, listening, or developing writing skills, all activities that we have in class and out of class should result in meaningful language use, meaning that they have to use the language as they would in the real life situation. Uh, students should have multiple opportunities to communicate with the language and 
during every class meetings. And for this reason, flipped classroom is so important because we want to have to give students more opportunities to use uh, the language in a functional way and, and work with the language. Uh, and as much as possible, materials and activities should be relevant to students' needs and interests, because we are talking, again, it's very important to reproduce, to mimic real-life interactions and situations in the classroom. Uh, so it's not uh, something like close society during, in the classroom uh, where the language used that is not used in real in real life. So the third principle is formative assessments. And when we uh, talk about assessments, we uh, talk about formative assessments and summative assessment. Summative assessments um, is something that um, is done uh, toward the end of the chapter, uh, toward the end of the semester or quarter, and the information that we obtain from the summative assessments gives us an idea where students are about their progress, but we don't use the summative assessments to improve students' learning. Formative assessments, on the other hand, uh, is something that we can we introduce, we have to introduce throughout the semester, uh, and formative assessments informs us about the progress of um, our learners and show learners what they can and cannot do and prepare them for end of sequence proficiency assessment. And a formative assessment can be formal and informal. That can be in forms of the quizzes uh, or online activities, or uh, they can be introduced in class in forms of games, in forms of various uh, activities that give students and instructors idea of where students are, what they are lacking, where they have to improve. And students should be practicing the task when they uh, face in proficiency assessment, which were intentionally designed to mimic tasks that they will do in the real life uh, world. This is to say that formative assessments have to prepare students for um, proficiency assessment, for summative assessment. This is something we cannot play with students during the semester and then have uh, an exam, final exam, with tasks that students did not practice during the semester. So they they should be connected and they should be connected to real life experience. Uh, principle number four is purposeful use of materials. And when we talk about uh, the uh, purposeful use of materials in the language classroom, it is very important to use authentic materials whenever possible and do as little as possible in adopting, changing, modifying, rewriting, or writing uh, the material, like creating materials um, uh, if from, from scratch. Uh, and, but the educators, have to evaluate the type of materials, whether they are original, adapted, simplified, or produced for their intended purposes. And again, it, it like everyone should take uh, into account the proficiency outcomes at every level when collecting or selecting the materials. Mm, then uh, make um, full use of materials and resources in order to derive the maximum benefits from them. This is very important because uh, um, young um, lecturers, uh, instructors, what I have been observing, they think the more they collect the better they will introduce students to many materials and content, a lot of content. This is this will take time, of course. That, that's maybe overwhelming, um, but the idea is a meaningful use the maximum use of material that one content, for example, one reading text can be uh, utilized, recycled, worked uh, for development of all basic language skills. It can be pre-reading, it can be used for grammar introduction, it can be for a post-reading activity, it can be utilized for follow-up writing activities, it can be used for speaking practice. So there should be maximum use of selected sources, which is good news 
focus for educators because uh, finding the authentic material is difficult, more difficult than creating assignments around this material. So students get the maximum use from, from a, an authentic um, input. And, and finally, principle five is maximize in class and out of class time, which is a flipped design, a flipped classroom. Basically, a traditional classroom is uh, students have a session in class, and they after class, they have homework. And during the class, uh, a professor can introduce grammatical content text, new text, new readings, and students work uh, with that. This is not the most efficient approach because a lot of time can be spent, especially in the language like Russian, which is a distant language, and the grammatical complex can take uh, the whole 50, uh, 50 minute session to explain, um, giving students no chance to work with the language in a functional way. So uh, flip classroom is the best option for learn language teaching, uh, and it consists in um, a pre-face-to-face -face, uh, phase which where students have to prepare to put participate in class activities. Then uh, during face-to-face -face class where students practice applying key concept, concepts with feedback from, from the instructor. And after class, students check their understanding and extend their learning. So the learning process in divi is divided into three parts in a flipped uh, classroom. And to talk, uh, to show you a little bit more about the idea of flip classroom, and I will demonstrate how the more weekly module looks like in my uh, classes. But the idea is online or pre-face-to-face, out-of-class self-study. So here we want to help students develop um, good learning uh, practices and habits where they uh, they have to work before they come to class and they should come to class prepared. So before the class, we have to teach discrete points, uh, point linguistic skills. That means that all grammar explanation, all grammar tutorials are moved online for students to go over on their own uh, before the class session and the class session should not be spent on explaining uh, grammar. Uh, definitely an uh, uh, instructor can clarify some points or integrate that knowledge into a class activities and the practice for sure. Uh, so the exposure to authentic materials should happen before the class, not during the class, because it takes time. And during the class, we want to practice uh, working with its content and not just introduce students to the content. Activities that prepare students for the in-class activities and activities preparing students for real-world language use, also activities relevant to students' needs and interest. So this should be all moved before the class session. During the class session, uh, students will communicate with the language, and the focus is here on communicate. So we want to enhance uh, student uh, communication, communicative proficiency, communicative skills. And students, oh, in, during the class session, the idea is students will be uh, interacting with the professor and each other. So that is, is the work in pairs, the work, yeah, work in group, debates, discussions, et cetera, and focus on what learners cannot do by themselves. This should be um, taking place during the class. And after, in the post a uh, face-to-face uh, phase, at home, students have to do some formative assessments to see whether they grasp the material that was practiced here and here and uh, just and build that confidence, have more practice. So this is all should be in alignment. And again, it's um, uh, when we find the right text, we have to think about this 
this circle, right? Everything is aligned, everything is connected. So before the class, this is a preview. In class, it's do, actually, we do this together. And after class, extend, expand on the knowledge. And in the end, formative assessment. So this is the kind of a mini, mini uh, uh, circle of representing the model of a flipped classroom. So flip design, when we think about flip design and when we create uh, out of class activities and tasks for students, we have to think what can learners do on their own? What can only and what can only be done during face to face? And of course, like group work, for example, right? Interaction that we want to happen in class that should be happening uh, happening uh, face to face. Then pre and post face to face assignments and activities should be deliber deliberately structured so that learners work with the materials intentionally. And when students are used, um, if they understand the idea of flip design, it also takes time to explain. It's very important to explain to students what the flipped model is and the benefits of the flipped model. So students take initiative and responsibility for preparing before the class session. And uh, so the assignments, the activities should be well structured, meaning that in the pre face to face activities and assignments, students should be doing something that will be practiced in class. They cannot read the text and work on the text and then they come to, to class and we don't focus on the text at all because we, we want to do something else. That That is not alignment. The, so uh, everything should be uh, very well aligned. Uh, and whenever possible, uh, work that learners do outside of class should be integrated into in-class activities. That's what I just um, mentioned. So everything should be connected. Uh, the uh, sixth principle is strategic use of technology. And uh, uh, many, uh, I think many educators uh, have ambivalent uh, feelings about technology. Some hate technology, some love technology, some lo love using technology in their classrooms. Technologists give lots of ben like have many benefits that educators can definitely utilize. Although uh, technology and educational platforms can get overwhelming because there is so many tools available out there that it's just easy to get completely overwhelmed with, with the technology. I use technology a lot in my classes, in my flipped model and through, through throughout the curriculum. And we have a series of online classes as well. So, but I use technology very strategically. And uh, the multimedia technology has to be used to achieve the goals. The first consideration is always, why do I need to use this technology? How does it help me enhance my, my tests and help students achieve the learning outcomes? So the technology should enhance instructions and not drive the instructions. Um, and technology use should help students develop target functions and help instructors implement reverse design, flipped design, communicative activities, and formative assessments. So, uh, excuse me. So, uh, and I keep repeating again as the coordinator, I keep repeating to my, my, my staff, my faculty, that we have to always remember that proficiency goals and functions have to drive all of our design choices, not the textbook, not a test, not anything else. Because what I tend to see that some um, language instructors, they have the textbook and they design uh, the curriculum around the test, te te textbook, meaning I want to cover four chapters in this semester. So I'm going to uh, structure my semester like this. So I cover chapter one, two, three, 
and for etc. And this is not the right approach uh, if um, uh, there is no consideration of proficiency goals. Um, there should be uh, the instructor's language instructor should be liberated from the textbook because we don't have to uh, use every assignment, every activity in the textbook or have to stick to one textbook in, in the class in the year. If the textbook does not help us uh, help students achieve learning uh, outcomes in the class, then uh, the instructor should be flexible and should feel free to eliminate something from the textbook, not to skip the chapter, skip uh, the activities or assignments, be more creative and think, uh, bring more authentic materials into the classroom. And uh, so the guidance, again, the proficiency goals and functions should drive all our our choices. And we have to consider what, which tools, text, and activities fit our students' needs. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, when we design a flipped classroom, we are always thinking about four basic language skills, reading, listening, writing, and speaking. And we also think about how do we uh, uh, teach grammar and vocabulary. And so those considerations are important when we flip the classroom, because every skill should, um, uh, we should pay equal attention to every language skill uh, during the semester, and we should not prioritize any skill over other. So, uh, so when we're designing reading and listening, we have to identify inputs, inputs the text, the authentic text that we are going to use. We have to design all uh, pre-face-to-face in-class and post-face-to-face activities, assignments, and formative assessments. And when we do writing and speaking, we have to redesign of writing and speaking tasks, plus all formative assessment, and it's great if writing and speaking tasks are connected to our inputs and listening and reading. And then actually, this is a good approach because you don't have to find a, a new input for every skill. You can have one input and utilize it to practice all skills and use it as a context to introduce and practice grammatical concept and vocabulary. And grammar and vocabulary, so development of out-of-class instructional materials related in-class uh, activities and formative assessments for grammar and vocabulary. So how does the flip classroom look like and what activities uh, we, can, we can choose for, uh, for the pre-face-to-face -face activities? And again, the pre-face-to-face -face activities, the introduction to material, the preview, right, should be very well structured. And that could be reading or listening input. So students will have to read or listen to the input um, multiple times for multiple purposes. And they can answer comprehension questions, short answer, multiple choice matching, fill in the blanks, all kind of regular uh, quiz type uh, uh, questions. Then identify, for example, look up, collect relevant vocabulary from the uh, text, identify, uh, notice the particular grammar features in the text, and write questions for uh, the author for the intended readership that can be utilized then in the um, in the in class in class phase. So, how do we explore those inputs in during face to face activities? Uh, so the in-class activities should be less structured activities than before the class, and activities result in level-appropriate language uh, use. So, and during the class, an instructor can briefly check comprehension, compare uh, homework responses with each other, share vocabulary, grammar findings from pre-class activities, discuss, share, and practice reading, listening strategies, uh, definitely role-playing based on the text, and uh, presentations, interviews, all kinds of games. And uh, group activities that require genuine level appropriate communication about the text uh, that uh, sh should happen during the class. And for example, well-structured discussions, guided discussions by the instructor or peers to like peer, 
uh, students uh, responding to the text, sharing opinions about the text, identifying cultural differences between this topic and the culture you're learning about and your own context, and engaging in text-specific activities. And so these are kind of tasks for a face-to-face -face activities that um, an instructor can, can choose from. And exploiting inputs, we continue with the input that we've worked in class and before the class and post class activities, formative assessments and assignments um, should be more open ended and activities result in a level, a level appropriate language, again, appropriate for every proficiency level. So students can respond to the text, write back, comment on, adapt, compare, adapt the text for another purpose, genre, participate in online discussions with each other, write back to the author, open-ended activities, device alternative endings, text-specific activities, use the semantic field to develop together during the class session for a discussion essay, etc. So again, a more open-ended where students can actually use the language functionally in, in writing, in speaking, uh, in and uh, put the knowledge together and produce something. Uh, so uh, can-do statements are very important in flip designs and, uh, um, and uh, they're a very simple idea, but uh, very beneficial for learning instructions. And uh, can, what are the advantages for the learners for can-do statements? And I'm going to show you an example of can-do statements in my classes. And usually, so we, we have a can-do statement basically in the syllabus where then when we say that by the end of the class, the students should be able Able to do this, this, and this, and use uh, like the language in this way, in this way. So this is can do statement, right? Uh, and uh, for every proficiency level, then uh, every uh, when preparing, working on the chapter, for example, if uh, an educator is using a chapter from the books that suits uh, his or her proficiency needs, um, then uh, there should be can do statements. What students will be able to do by the end of this chapter, right? And usually the textbooks, they start with this kind of information, what grammar will be covered, what topics will be covered. So this is this is very easy to redo this in can-do statements. And But also preparing every class and cycle pre-face-to-face, face-to-face and post-face-to-face is very important for an instructor to think, what do I want my students to be able to do by the end of this class? And this question should govern the preparation um, for the class and the materials that uh, you select and utilize and how you do that. Uh, so um, the advantages, uh, there are several advantages of uh, to, do, to do statements or uh, lists. So they allow students to set short term goals and that are clearly defined daily or unit level. And again, you know, at the beginning of the class, I tend to say, you know, by the end of the class, guys, I want us to be able to do this, this, and this. That's why we're going to focus on this, this. And students are informed and they their focus is better on the task. They know what to expect. They know the final destination for every class, for a week, for a chapter. So this is an important to inform a student about, the, about that destination. Uh, they allow for longer term goals. Students can look ahead course and program and see, okay, this is what I'm going to be engaging with what kind of material and task for this in this, this month, in this chapter. And they can provide clear evidence of progress. And I always encourage students when we finish the chapter, for example, uh, when we finish a week, I encourage students to go back to can do list and see self-evaluate and see where they are and what they are comfortable with and what needs to be revised. So it, it means like it's important to delegate that responsibility from, an, from an, an instructor to the student, to have students share that responsibility with us. So be a student to help students be responsible for their progress. 
and and the statesman should provide clear evidence of progress and uh and as i mentioned the statement should allow for self-assessment and students feel more responsibility for their learning and they feel more comfortable with where they are they are not lost they don't feel lost and uh, this is for example a can do statements um, for uh we had a unit we uh, everything about the computers and internet and how the internet took our life away <laughs> And uh, here are the learning objectives. I state the learning objectives that we will, like if we have two and a half weeks or three weeks during this unit, uh, I, I inform my students what um, in this chapter you will learn new vocabulary and grammar to talk about computers and the internet. And by the end of it, you'll be able to do the following. And so this is the to-do statement that I want them to read closely before we start the chapter. And then at the end of the chapter, I want them, I, I have have them go back to the, the to-do list and check for themselves, self-evaluate whether they are indeed a, able to complete those tasks. And I include the main grammar of the chapter. So they, they uh, kind of have them informed for, from start. Uh, and technology, finally technology. Uh, technology is... Uh, um, we have to start with the goal and choose the technology that lets us accomplish uh, accomplish what we want to do in our backward design in the class. And with the technology, again, since it's becoming uh, overwhelming and so many uh, platforms appear, uh, we want to consider time investment for us and for students and whether um, whether it's worth investing our time into creating something simple that will not lead to uh, to the goals that we want to achieve. And uh, we want to think about accessibility consideration for our students. Uh, we want to think about internet access and text requirements and value and quality of, um, of the uh, task that we create with the technology and alignment with what we know about uh, language, uh, language learning. And uh, when we use technology, we have to definitely plan ahead and uh, learn early. And uh, if we are not comfortable with anything, it's always a good idea to ask for help um, or oh, the tech support. Um, and there are already many tools that we can utilize on our daily basis that we have accessible um, uh, on daily basis. Uh, like we're using Canvas at UNL, so we can utilize announcements or weekly plans with to-do lists. We can create multimedia and uh, using screen recorders that we have on the computer, or uh, we're using uh, VidGrid or VoiceThread. And definitely we can use camera phones and phone recordings because we know students have those devices. We can utilize that as well. Uh, we have to think about modifying multimedia, downloading, copying, editing, adding captions where necessary, making interactive videos. And I'm going to show an example of interactive videos that we make for our classes. And I use H5P platform. This is my favorite platform to use for language classes. I'm very excited to share more about it. Uh, and a wonderful resource for teachers is 360 Cities, which allows actually uh, educators can have a free account uh, on this platform. The, uh, the website has many uh, 360s, panoramas, pictures from all around the world on any topic you can imagine. And the teachers, uh, if they have a free account, they can utilize their panoramas, to create a guided interactive video tours and embed interactions in the panoramas and put some text. Uh, I definitely suggest, you know, if you're interested in technology, absolutely check 360 cities for teachers and their guided tours. They are amazing. And you can embed the audios and there are text, uh, links to other sources, and also the quizzes. And it, it's a lot of fun for students to go through the interactive uh, presentations. 
And uh, we also think about conversations with other speakers. If it's uh, online activities, we use, I use Flipgrid a lot. I think now it's called Flip, uh, which allows for interaction uh, among students outside of the classroom. And we can use uh, discussion form and, uh, for, uh, forums. And I use Poll Everywhere uh, a lot. That's my, my, one of my favorite platforms here. And uh, we also have to think about distributing and hosting multimedia uh, via Canvas, uh, cloud storage drive, Dropbox, whatever you know platform you're using for your purposes. And uh, uh, we also can think about student creating multimedia. Um, but with that, if we want students to create something, a presentation, a slides, whatever, we have to give students very clear directions and instructions. And it might be Canvas recordings, embedding, um, you know, into an assignment, something, the flip grip, interactions, and uh, things like that. And uh, these are favorite platforms for uh, for gamification for students like Quizlet, where they can do the flashcards and quizzes. And uh, Canvas has lots of tools that can be utilized. Kahoot, of course, uh, and H5P, that again, I'm going to focus on. And we think about the assessment a task online versus face face to face. What can be used online and what should be better used uh, face to face. Uh, definitely when we focus on selecting the materials, there is a lot, I mean, I mean we should not be inventing a, uh, you, you know, a bicycle. There is a lot already available there. And for example, University of Texas, they have open educational resources with lots of activities in foreign languages. Uh, but again, once again, the considerations that we should have, does this help my students reach their proficiency goals and produce level appropriate language? And does this activity lead up to or build upon other activities? And again, scaffolding is very important throughout the semester, throughout the chapter, uh, throughout the course. Uh, and um, and sometimes it's okay to push beyond the goal once in a while. If a teacher wants to have I guess, some fun activity, maybe not very well aligned with the uh, you know proficiency outcomes, it's okay to have that from time to time. And at this point, I want to move to more kind of interactive, more interesting. I think less uh, less terminological, pedagogical um, part of my presentation. And I'm going to talk about H5P tool that again, I love and I use a lot in my classes throughout the curriculum in the first year and second year in the third year. Um, so what is H5P? Uh, this is a community uh, offering a way to create free portable HTML5 responsive and mobile friendly interactive activities. And uh, so you can register for this web uh, website for free and practice, try the acti all the activities types that they have there uh, and use them, embed them in your uh, learning uh, management system. But also plugins exist for WordPress, Moodle and Drupal for free. If you have those websites, you can uh, have the plugin and create already on them. And content can also be embedded into any website or CMS that accepts embed codes. That's what I I do and I will show you how it looks like for the learners. And contents can be shared between platforms. The only thing you need is the code and you can share it. Uh, and it has around 30 activity types, uh, or oh, I think even more than that, and more continues to be created. It's a wonderful resource for teachers, amazing resource. And uh, uh, just to give you an idea of content types and how it looks on, on the website, and you're absolutely welcome to explore on your own on the website, but just to give you an idea, and I don't even use uh, every type, I haven't done every Every type, I but I have my favorite content types that I use very often. And I'll show you some examples. But for example, they have accordion. It just is a very good way to structure a lesson. Uh, it's kind of lesson plan that you can open 
you can have like with the sections kind of in a very um, organized way. Um, you, they have audio recorder, they have collage, they have charts, they have um, arism arithmetic quiz that we don't use for language purposes. But I think every teacher can find something that they can use on this website. They have notes, columns, and crosswords. So students can do crosswords and dialogue cards and dictation, documentation tools drop uh, drop uh, drag and drop and drag the words it's a wonderful tool and i'll show you an example of this they can do assays fill in the blanks and i'll uh, find multiple uh, hot spots i will show you an example of this as well uh, find the hot spot they have uh, find the words, uh, uh, flashcards, I uh, guess the answer, um, image choice, uh, image hotspots, and very, very many different types. And I, I don't even know some of these, but they have really great presentations, the tools to create presentations. They have wonderful interactive books, uh, mark the words. It's one of the most used a lot in my classes uh, they have memory game i'll show you the use of that as well multiple choice like the standard content types but questionnaire quiz set where you can have in one quiz a variety of questions also very helpful and uh, um, a single choice set and you can see it's an overwhelming amount of content types um, that it takes time to look over them but usually it's very intuitive and user-friendly they have tutorials it's not difficult to create once you start creating the types it's very easy and quickly you can create something meaningful and interesting for students and my uh, since I work with virtual reality I love 360 tours uh, you can upload any picture from the website for example 360 cities that I mentioned you can upload any picture uh, from that website here for example you can annotate it uh, with the uh, icons vocabulary icons text you can link the resources you can link the pages internet pages you can uh, upload the videos or an audios into the picture and also create quizzes within uh, the the picture so it's it, you can create really very interactive content and interactive video is something that i use all the time on a daily basis so i'll also show you an example of interactive video and uh, uh, course presentations etc so uh, why do I use interactive activities in my classes? And again, I have regular classes that follow flip model and I have online or hybrid classes that um, don't have a regular face-to-face -face time. Uh, so I have to um, incorporate activities and engage students with me and with each other um, in the online platform. Um, but they increase independence in the learners. So learners uh, feel more uh, responsible for their learning progress process. Uh, they, um, they offer media rich experiences. They give immediate feedback. That's, they are amazing learning tools. And so the, the professor does not have to leave a feedback. And they have specific feedback if they, uh, the instructor wants to input a specific feedback. Uh, to any given answer that can be done there and they can be adopted across disciplines across languages and uh, they can be really personalized and the most useful activities types for me personally these are the types that i use on a daily basis and again i'm not using all those types but i do use drag and drop drag the words fill in the blanks image hotspots mark words multiple choice questionnaire true false and interactive videos and uh at the again um, uh, there is this plugin for H5P at WordPress, Moodle, and Drupal. And for example, how I'm using it, um, they have to have all the functionality of the website. You have to create an account and you have to uh, pay uh, for, for the account, but they have flexibility there. So all those plugins are free if you, you have those, if you have WordPress, Moodle, or Drupal. So at UNL, I request a personal website through our institution and they use Drupal. So I can, uh, and my attack 
technical support uh, uploaded the module for HYP and I use all the content type without paying anything. So I have access to all the content type through the website, not on their website, but through my personal website. And even if you're using uh, the version for free, it, it has a little bit limited um, content types available, but st still teachers can use it for free. They can embed on their, um, on, in their uh, system. And at this point, I want to um, uh, share with you some presents, some games, if you don't mind, some uh, some examples, <laughs> some visuals um, uh, from. Hold on, I um, new share. Okay, uh, I have to stop sharing at this point and do. Okay, so uh, can you see my uh, my internet like my my page, right? Okay. Uh, so here I just want to show you how my weekly module, and this is the second year Russian, and how my weekly module looks like. So this is week five, and so this uh, says this is Monday, and this is Wednesday, and this is Friday, and because we meet in the second year, we meet three times for 50 minutes, and this is so, like in the first year, we meet five times for 50 minutes. In the second year, the class time is reduced, so that's why in the flipped classroom is so important, especially in the second year in, in, in the advanced class. So, um, for example, on Monday, before the class, they have to study the days of the week, the new words, instructions, and there is always a comprehension check that follow this. During this class, we uh, incorporate the material that they study before the class, and uh, after the class, they do homework after, after it. And I'll show you an example of this. So the same for Wednesday. So here for Wednesday, they have before the class, they have to read and work on the text, learn new vocabulary and do the comprehension check. And comprehension check is very important because that's for me to see if my students are prepared and come prepared to class. And uh, so during the class, we work on that uh, the text in a functional way. And after the class, they have the homework that uh, extends, expands on, on the text, the open, open-ended homework. And on Friday, they uh, the focus is on grammar, so they do a grammar uh, overview from dative case, uh, for example, and comprehension uh, check and new vocabulary. During the class, we work on that grammar, incorporating meaningful context, maybe using the same or similar text, expand on the text we used on Wednesday. And in the end, they have the homework, and every week we have a quiz for students to as an assessment. So basically, I'll just show you how, for example, uh, the page pre face to face page looks like. So, for example, uh, the days of the week. Uh, for, and this is the H5P content incorporated in the page here. So, let's review the days of the week in Russian. And here they have to drag and drop. And this is wonderful activity because it engages students uh, and enhances uh, kinesthetic skills when students can say, well, this is Monday is Panitelnik and Tuesday is Vtornik and they can continue doing this um, and put all those words in the places they belong. And when they're done, they can check. And here you go. And students already uh, receives the immediate feedback that this is correct. So this is in a format of the game. Students love it. That does not record in Canvas for me to see. It's a learning tool. We expect students to do it, uh, utilize it. But we also, they have to share responsibility for that. So we expect them to do it. Uh, then there is, uh, for example, uh, when and on which day we have a little poetry here where the days of the weeks are used in context and some grammar uh, introduction about how to use the days of the week in Russian in a meaningful way, what grammar should be used. And here we want students to learn new vocabulary because we don't want to spend any time during the class on learning new vocabulary, maybe some practice uh, saying new words, but not learning new vocabulary. 
regular. So this is something they have to do before the class. And here is listening and repeat after, after me in this case, uh, some of the expressions, and I give some additional grammar explanation expressions. So this will take time students to, uh, to go over this. And they have, it should be followed by um, a comprehension check because we want to ensure, we want to control this learning process in a way so students complete the comprehension check. Every preface to face ends with a comprehension check. Um, and for example, to give you an idea of grammar, uh, for example, before preface to face, students have to go and here uh, we have all the uh, video uh, tutorials, dative endings in written format um, and example sentences. So if you open uh, all the tutorials, grammar tutorials, if they're available on the internet, we include them or we can record and create interactive presentations on the grammar that we study and embed it in the page as well. And here are just more visual for students, for visual students, if the learners are more visual, and some examples in sentences, how this is used. So this is an example of a pre face to face activities um, that happen before the class. This is an example that my colleague, uh, my lecturer in Russian, created for the first year students. And for example, so she wanted students to go over dialects um, before the class and and to focus the class session on working with the language from the dialect and have students engage with the dialects during the class session. So for each dialect, they have to listen to a dialect and read it. And here, for example, uh, this is also H5P content, uh, drag and drop, and choose the image that corresponds to the dialect and place it in the empty space. So let's say I think uh, that this will be the case. Uh, and this is correct. Well, I guessed. And then uh, there is another dialect. And, and so it's very convenient to have all those content types to follow up like um, as a simple check and um, interactive check for different tasks. And here, for example, this is click uh, the words, click on all words that indicate an informal speech situation. So we were learning the formality check. So here, for example, probably this one, and I'm not sure, but maybe this one, maybe this one, let's check. Well, I got four out of five correct. Students can retry and do as many times as they want and uh, or they can see the solutions. They can have answers um, uh, after the try. And for example, the, in this uh, activity, so they have to um, actually fill in the blanks and answer the questions filling in the blanks and do the checking. As you can see, uh, a, the, the system does not give the correct answer without students entering something in the blanks. So, so they have to show, uh, they, they have to enter something. And for example, for this uh, dialogue, uh, th there's also click on the words that indicate a place, name, say to your country. So students do the same. And here, a uh, drag and drop activity. Как вас зовут, а как, uh, for example, тебя зовут. So what's your name? What's your name? Are you a student? Uh, your student. Uh, you do you live in England? Yes. Uh, where do you study? So things like that. So it's immediate access for students to check if they understand the dialogue. I really like the how she uh, she created this module, and some information on formal and informal speech situations. So this is an example of how a preface to face activities look like. And again, this is followed by comprehension check. Not that we don't trust students that they do it, but students want to have, we do want to control this process and see, because, uh, you know, when students uh, know that they have to do complete the task, they will focus more on the task. And so these examples, uh, my colleague Amber Olin, who teaches in the first and second year this year, 
uh, shared with me for this demonstration. Uh, so uh, this is a uh, drag the words, and this is one of my favorite types. It can be used in so many ways, and it allows again dragging, doing something with emotion, with hands, kinesthetic learning. Uh, perfect for that. And for example, fill in the blanks with the Russian uh, place names. This is for the beginners Russian. So this is a very uh, easy task. English, uh, England, probably Anglia, Madrid. I'm not going to do all of that, but just to show you an example how this is done. And when I'm done, uh, I can check and I got three out of 10 because I didn't really complete this. But we can look at the solutions and it does show the solutions, but we do hope we rely on students responsibility and the students will complete this. The students love those tasks. They do work on them. They, 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 they want more of them actually in their classes. So, for example, this is uh, also drag and drop, but here we have the days of the week, as we have seen uh, that embedded into a page, so I'm not going to look at that, but also the type of memory game. So here the students can, you know, look and try to do the memory game, and we can include the pictures and and words so they can actually play memory games over this platform and uh, this is a wonderful type it's a hot spots type where you upload the image and you give some instructions each form of transplantation has a button by it click on the button to learn how to talk about uh, taking that form of transportation like for example i want to go on the bus or take the car uh, ride the uh, the train etc and some basic information so whatever we want to put there for students and for example so here uh, there are embedded interactions and here um, we have an example of that word how it's used grammatically correct in the sentence and also there is an animation if students want to walk to watch something authentic um, they can go ahead and watch animation where this word is used authentically in the content so here is how the word is used again in the context in the translation and here's an uh, 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 the uh, the review of the, the actual page from the website that we can link to those images. So this is on the bicycle. And here is, for example, there is a... Um, a poster that she found uh, uh, that uh, illustrates the use of the word and so things like that and again another animation so students just working with one uh, picture they have access to all the vocabulary that we want them uh, to learn it's an interactive vocabulary list where students can see the words, can see examples. You can also, I believe, upload the audio files, uh, videos, link to the other sources. So it's really great resource for students. And when I mentioned 360 um, website where you can create uh, interactive um, uh, 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 vir virtual tours. This is similar functionality that you can use. And again, it's for free. If you like, uh, like this content, but you don't want to use H5P, this is something that can be done in, uh, in the 360 cities. So this is, this is a wonderful content type. And another, so this is click on the words and that's something we already uh, saw. For example, if we're looking for specific grammatical information and we want to check if students understand the use of cases or the use of certain grammar in context, so we can ask them to click on those words that are used in accusative case in this sense. And this is drag the image uh, to properly illustrate the sentence. So we have a blank spot for the images and we have, uh, for example, you have to drag, you know, the images and then, you know, check. So this is also, well, I didn't do it <laughs> correct, just for it to demonstrate uh, how it works. But this is like you are, you are, um, uh, you have to draw, dr drag and draw up the pictures. 
and I have a couple more uh, uh, activities for you to show. And uh, uh, so this is memory game. This is similar to what I have uh, shown you, but I tend to uh, choose fewer images for memory game because I know personally myself, I, I can get overwhelmed with our lots of images that disappear and my, my short-term memory doesn't work like that. So I prefer to do it, uh, you know, uh, one thing at a time and that disappears when when it disappears then it disappears and students can manage it much better much better so there is a variety how you organize it whether you see the text whether you use images uh, it's really fun to create and fun, fun for students to uh, to do and this is an example of flashcards uh, what does that card mean uh, so we can create a number of flashcards for students and have, uh, you know, I'm upset. So they have to type and check. Well, the Russian will be Yarostroyan. Oops, excuse me. I think that happens with, um, here, here we go. Um, so for example, we are writing, uh, learning about the documents so students can can learn and can type and can check the documents. And here is great that I can include the images for them to see also write in English and Russian images, you know, how to like the verb to steal, to lose the words that we are going to cover in the unit or in the text, but they can work uh, on their own and practice new words in this way. Uh, they also have a dialogue cards uh, where they can uh, learn and see whether I understand longer phrases and not just uh, single words. This is also a good type. And my favorite type is interactive video presentations that H5P offers that not many platforms offer to work with that. So basically for interactive presentations, that's great for grammar explanation. It's great to explanation of new concept. It's great to introduce a new topic. Um, and if you want, if you utilize YouTube videos and if you utilize any uh, videos, whether it's your own video uh, that you made or or uh, someone else's or YouTube, if it's open access, you can upload, link the video into the platform and you can make it interactive. And that's the idea of this type. And for example, just to give you an idea. Uh, so here I uploaded the animation uh, of Russian animation. And here you can see all those circles here. That means I embedded interactions for throughout the animation. And I'll show you, and basically you can in include all the content types that we've seen already in, uh, um, that I've, I've shown already into the interactive video. You can um, embed true or false, summary statement, drag and drop, uh, and things like that in the video. And I'll just show you how, uh, how it looks. I'll just uh, turn down the volume, uh, just not to be distractive. But here, when the interaction happens, um, I pause like, uh, uh, there is a functionality on the website that the video stops and students have to do the interaction before they, uh, they, they proceed further. So here in this case, Mark, what the snail ate for breakfast and where it went, for example, let's, let's th see, and this is, well, this is incorrect. Only one is correct. And I could see. Uh, and I could retry. So all those things I can do and I can continue. And when I continue, we move to the next um, uh, interaction. And again, the video is paused. And here we have a true or false, fa um, uh, true or false statements. Students can check and continue. So students get immediate feedback on their progress, whether they understand the content or not. And you can build as many interactions as you want for, for the purpose that you, you have for a given video. Like for example, drag the words into the right boxes. And so I basically, uh, so if they're uh, dragging this and students love those kinds of activities and types, and uh, uh, they enjoy that they, uh, 
we can make them work with the content, with the input in a very meaningful way and not be, especially with the uh, listening skills, with watching, um, we, we want to engage them in and be active participants in those skills, not the passive recipient of the information. So here, this is a great way to make them active participants and click on the all words that are above the snail. And uh, so what else do I have here? Let's see. I find, I fill in the missing words. So here they have to type. And uh, what else? What is interesting here? And drag the words into the uh, boxes. So here I want them to learn some vocabulary and I have some uh, words in Russian and in English. And here they they drag and drop. Again, by dragging, they, uh, they engage in kinesthetic learning. And so they can they can do that and learn as they watch. And that's that's in line with the purpose that I'm pursuing. So again, drag and drop and things things like that. And uh, a true or false once again. Uh, and the the multiple choice. And uh, so the activity types like that and one video can have all those interactions. And this is open like ended question, multiple choice. Uh, again, based on the animation. Now let's see, again, drag and drop. I love that drag and drop activity content type. And, uh, and things like that. So uh, I think at this point, uh, I have shown you what I wanted to show, true or false. And let's see, what is the last interaction here? Uh, drag, drag and drop. So we have a video of three minutes, three and a half minutes, but we make students work on it for at least seven minutes, seven, eight minutes. And this is in line with our um, uh, with our goals for, for this class. And before I end and open this to the questions, I just want to mention a few things about the Russian program again. And that's something I, uh, I mentioned at the beginning that we have in the first year, we have online sequence. Uh, all our first year classes, um, uh, we have an in-person format and online uh, format. And we do want to uh, recruit and engage high school students in our classes. And we have a number of high school students who are taking our classes while they are in high schools. And that gives them the advantage because when they come to our classes, they can be placed in a higher level Russian classes already as they enter. Uh, and we started offering our classes through Nebraska now. And we offer first year, first semester of Russian through Nebraska now in the spring. And we also offer first semester Russian more accelerated format uh, of first semester in the summer first and second semester. So we offer all one first year sequence uh, 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 online uh, in, uh, and um, uh, we offer it through Nebraska now for high school students. And we are very, very interested in more high school students. First of all, uh, we want them to know that this is an option that understand that the value of critical language, right, crash language, how important it is uh, for uh, national security. And this is something that they want to see their career going forward. I think that's an amazing opportunity for our students to enroll in our classes. And as you have seen, our classes are very interactive. We have lots of games, activities. Uh, we're using all, uh, lots of tools in our online classes. They are very, very interactive. They have a lot of communication uh, among students and with students and, and with the professors. And what we do this semester, and this is something also we want to spread the word about it, we offer a sample uh, Russian lessons that are often open to public if uh, students want to try the first mini lessons in Russian. We have days and one lesson will be on Thursday, November 17th this week from 1 to 1.30 p.m. It will be via Zoom 
it will be introduction to Russian lesson. And please spread the word. I will send the flyer if you want to, you know, uh, circulate it among anyone interested. You can try, you know, the lesson yourself. It's it's open because you know we have many uh, non-traditional students students in our classes too, who are not students who, who have jobs and we, we can accommodate their schedules. And we have, we are very flexible about that. And we also, so these are the days that we have set and times and university community uh, schools are uh, welcome. Students are welcome to join it. But we also uh, offer, you can, if you are um, a teacher, you have, you are teaching students and you have, uh, you want to have a uh, sample mini, Zoom mini class of Russian just to introduce students to Russian language or culture. We have two mini um, uh, uh, classes. 50 minutes or 30 minutes each we can um, we can be flexible in terms of time that teachers want to have that you know, we can arrange that to have a russian mini classes uh, mini lesson whether on culture or on language for your class just in that case just contact me to request it and we will organize it and this semester, we've already had two sample classes with uh, students in sixth grade and eighth grade, just to introduce, and it doesn't have to be high school students, we just want to introduce Russian language and culture to, uh, to students uh, in schools. And uh, we have uh, the resources to do it. We have a wonderful lecturer who, who lives in Toronto, actually, who works for us. She conducts those mini classes and she does a wonderful job on, on Zoom. Uh, so please contact me. This is my email um, address and I will share um, the flyer if you are interested, if you want to spread the word. And uh, if you... If you if you want to have a Russian mini class, please contact me and we will make arrangements. It can be this semester or next semester. Uh, just be in touch. And at this point, I thank you so much for your attention, for being with me for one hour and a half on this uh, Saturday morning. And uh, thank you for being with me. And I want to open it to questions if we have time. Thank you. Oh, we have a question in our chat. Um, Liao Lao she asked, uh, can we print out the materials on H1, uh, H5P? Uh, um, well, definitely you can print them out uh, as you can copy paste or do a screenshot and print them out for sure. I mean, I haven't thought about this, but this is a great idea if you know how to build a content and use it in class. Absolutely, I think that's a wonderful idea. Um, yes, definitely, you can print it out without the answers and students can work together on inputting the answers. It's more difficult with the interactive videos, right? Because that have to be, but they can be watched together in class and students can answer together. So definitely all those activities can be done in class, even if you have, or even if you're not, having them as a handouts for students uh, the activity can be on the screen on one screen and students can still engage and interact and provide the answers and the, uh, the teacher can input the answers absolutely but I think there is like a lot of possibilities how to use this content mm -hmm. thank you uh, do you know how much do we have to pay if we do not have access to I mean their platform you have I did not check on that. I know that they have uh, some plans uh, that um, uh, the educators can come together and have one account and create all their activities under one account, which I think is a great way to collaborate and work together. And those activities don't have even to be, you know, on one discipline, on one topic. But for example, if it's something that... Um, teachers would like to come together and do together and pay together. So there is, I know that they have this fee and uh, um, I would check with the school's administration if the school would like to uh, help sponsor this and pay for this because the different ways how to get, you know, because it's a great resource for, for teachers. 
and maybe um, I know that I try to do request a license for H5P for UNL, but somehow it didn't go through. But I think the school's administration can actually request and pay for the license for all teachers to use. So I think there are uh, options there. And for uh, like WordPress, um, I know I considered before I learned that I can get a personal website through my institution. I was considering having a website on WordPress that is minimal fee. Uh, for a, a monthly fee where I can have a plugin of H5P and have access, free access to all the types. When, when there is this plugin uh, that on those websites, so that means that you don't have to, to pay um, the fee. You, have, you don't have to even register for H5P. You will have access to all content types because it's an educational platform and they want to, they, they work together with those um, uh, with all platforms and so i that's how i do it and um, and it's also great to have a personal site website and have all the activities and organize all the activities on the personal website and have them in one place so the, the there is a variety you have to do a little bit of research to see what works best for for everyone okay this is a great tool you showed yeah, thank you for I'm glad you enjoyed it. I am a, a huge fan. I always, you know, I tell people about it. And I learned about it during one of the workshops that I attended. And I was fascinated with the possibilities that this tool gives. And I have used it ever since. And I recruit people. <laughs> I just, people start using it because I'm so excited about it. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions? Oh. Yeah, I think we are seven minutes uh, overdue. Over time. <laughs> Over time, I yes. apologize for that, but it was... It's, it's okay, yeah. You can send your flyers to me and I can share with more teachers. Thank okay. you. And I will also share the, the link to the PowerPoint presentation. I'll probably share, post it on Drive and share the link to it because it's too large to... Uh, to be sent by by email, but I will definitely share this. Thank you, Olga. Uh, we really appreciate this. Thank you. Absolutely. And everyone, thanks for being with us for this great presentation. And have a nice weekend. Hope you join us next spring. Okay, thank you so much for having me. And you know, you have my contact information if you want to get in touch with me anytime. And I hope we will have a follow-up conversation about the possibilities where we can, how we can introduce Russian. Yeah, uh, you yeah know. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.